Ladies and gentlemen, welcome officially to the second portion of our day to 20,000 Voices, our open spaces discussion on exploring issues of community, equity, and diversity. My name is Melissa Boyd Colvin. I am the Assistant Director for the Center for Student Leadership Development and here with you all today as a facilitator of our process. During this window of time between 11.30 and 12.30 in our day today, we thank you all for accepting the invitation to be here with us today. And this will be a busy and productive time in that we will hear some words and from our leadership as well as from our keynote today. And then we'll take a few moments to talk with you about the rest of the afternoon and the process before us, where we, where we will ask you all to engage in the process of attending sessions between 12.30 and 1.45, and to perhaps pose some questions about what will lead us in those discussions. I'll return later and talk a little bit more about the process, and you'll see our slideshow continuing later that talks a little bit about what we've done this morning for those that joined us in the morning sessions. When we do have a moment to pause, I would suggest as well that individuals have the opportunity to look at the newsroom once again, what has already been discussed before we move to afternoon sessions and perhaps pose new topics. So, as we move to our agenda for this afternoon, I would like to introduce Dr. Annie Russell from the LGBT Center to talk about our afternoon sessions and to introduce our speakers. Annie? Hi again, folks. Just wanted to welcome you back from the morning sessions and take just a moment to introduce our provost at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, so we are very fortunate at this university to have an academic unit that is so wholeheartedly wholeheartedly invested in diversity and diversity initiatives and inclusion on our campus uh, by supporting programs such as the Multicultural Enhancement Fund and the LGBT Faculty Fellows Program, the Provost Office has really shown us as an institution that they're committed to inclusion and diversity at the institution. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our Provost, Don DeHayes, to offer some comments on the day. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, actually, good morning for another 10 minutes. And thank you all for, for being here. This is an, a very important day in the university. It's a day where the community comes together and discusses topics that, frankly, many communities don't want to discuss. Um, shortly after President Obama was elected the first time, he appointed his attorney general, Eric Holder, and Eric Holder, in a public presentation, said, Americans don't like talking about issues related to race and justice and inequity. And I, that's, that's stuck in my head because I, I know that to be true. In fact, it makes people very uncomfortable. If you want to ever clear out a room at a cocktail party saying, hey, I observed some racism the other day or some homophobia in the community, and people just want to disappear, they don't want to talk about it. So the reason I tell that brief story is because if there's one place in our society where we need to have these kinds of conversations, that we need to talk about those subjects that make some people uncomfortable, it's in universities. I, I, I'm willing to bet that it's less likely to happen in, in our corporate offices around the country. And it's even less likely to happen in our political offices around the country. because. People are not comfortable talking about these difficult subjects. So that's one point I wanted to make as I commend you all for being here and spending the various times during the day today to participate in these important and sort of freelance discussions about issues of multiculturalism in the broadest context in regard to the University of Rhode Island community. And I want to make a second point. 
and then refer you to a document as we move forward with the day. And that point is, issues of multiculturalism really are, are about understanding and learning. It's not just simply about advocacy, although that in itself is important. It's not just simply about inclusion, although clearly that is important. It's about learning. It's about learning and it's about understanding. The former president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, said, and this is a quote from many, many years ago that stuck in my head, he said, we need to, as leaders in particular, we need to spend more time understanding than explaining. And I would argue, as citizens, certainly of the University of Rhode Island community, we need to spend more time understanding difference than explaining our own perspective and our own view of the world. So there's an opportunity to create learning. That's why universities exist. So not only am I pleased that we, we've come together today, and I hope we will do this every year, with Naomi, the little plug there, that we do this every year, that we create a dialogue about what for some might be difficult or uncomfortable subjects, but we also then translate that dialogue into opportunities to learn. The university's Academic Affairs Diversity Task Force, just a, a couple of years ago, put together a document, it's on the Provost Office website, it's on the Diversity Task Force website, and it's called the Framework for Multicultural Learning in the University of Rhode Island Community. And I hope you'll look at it, because it really emphasizes the opportunity, not only the opportunity, but the necessity to learn about this. Not to simply advocate for it, not to simply recruit and retain more different types of student, staff, and faculty, all of which are important, but to create formal learning. In, in the university world, the currency relates to the curriculum. And our curriculum, in my view, must reflect broad perspectives that deal with, begin perhaps with exposure, one of the items discussed in our uh, framework for multicultural learning, and then proceeding towards, towards knowledge and understanding around multiculturalism. There is a base of information you need to know, study, learn, be tested on, test yourself on, that relates to understanding of issues of power and privilege and so forth. There's also levels of skills that many of us don't have and need to develop and, and hone those skills so that we can communicate and dialogue uh, in a world of difference. And then ultimately, upon exposure and understanding and development of skills, comes the transformation that I think all of us are looking for, for our community on campus and our society more broadly. So on behalf of the University of Rhode Island, our faculty, our staff, all of our students, the university leadership, thank you for giving part of your day today to an important uh, conversation, one that will begin in earnest on into the future. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to now pass the baton to the university's chief diversity officer, Naomi Thompson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Provost DeHayes. I sincerely appreciate all of the support that the Office of the President and the Office of the Provost and Student Affairs and all of our collaborators, all of the folks in community equity and diversity, and all of you. I'm so thrilled to see all of you here this afternoon. You are a different crowd. You are more than you were this morning. And so welcome to all of the folks who were not here for the welcome this morning. Uh, and we are so appreciative of your voice. During the sessions, I had an opportunity to walk around, and I could feel the heat in the rooms. I could feel the excitement. I could feel hear interesting dialogue going on, so I am so pleased that you all came out and those who may have left and voted with their feet and came and went and said their piece, I also thank that those folks as well. Uh, for those of you who just joined us this afternoon, my name is Naomi Thompson and I am honored to be the first permanent Chief Diversity Officer here uh, at the University of Rhode Island. However, I have to give It is definitely a distinct honor and truly a pleasure. 
However, I was not the first person to hold this position, and I want to acknowledge my predecessors, Abu Bakr, who was the brainchild behind this, bringing this concept to fruition with respect to today's event. So we want to also give thanks to Abu and his predecessor also, Catherine Friedman, who was also very, very instrumental in me coming here to the University of Rhode Island. It's not my job to come up here and give speeches. It's actually my job to introduce the keynote speaker. So I'm going to be quick. However, uh, could, where's, is Katrina here? Uh, Katrina, was, uh, Katrina Dorsey was so kind as to print out these pledge forms. So we have lovely gifts for you, these blue wristbands that says, I pledge CED. Well, they're lovely gifts to have, but it also goes along with a promise. And there is a pledge that um, has been passed around to each table, and we encourage each person to take this pledge, and it says Community Equity and Diversity Pledge. As a member of the University of Rhode Island Community Pledge, to help to sustain a safe, equitable, and inclusive environment, recognizing and respecting diversity to be there for the URI community by developing authentic relationships based on dignity, respect, and mutual trust, to aspire to promote positive change where needed, to maintain the highest standard of honesty, integrity, and personal responsibility. And that's a lot. Today we are talking, and this is a time to dialogue and bring about talk. But what I'm asking you to do is not only talk the talk, but then go out and challenge the behaviors. Be mindful and think about, be very intentional in your actions. And so I ask you to take the pledge and sign these forms and, and uh, leave them outside at the front desk. So having said that, <clears throat> it is a very distinct honor and a pleasure to present your keynote speaker for this afternoon. Liz Walker is an ordained minister, an entrepreneur, a television journalist, a documentary film producer, and a humanitarian who most recently worked in war-torn southern Sudan. As a 2005 graduate of Harvard Divinity School, she has chosen to combine her, her passion for communication skills with her passion for serving the world. For over 20 years, she was on the air at WBZ Television, and there were quite a few folks who remembered that. And some folks who are still watching her on her television magazine health series called Better Living with Liz Walker on Boston's WCVB Television. In the summer of 2001, Liz Walker traveled to war-torn Sudan on a fact-finding mission on the controversial slave trade in southern Sudan. She was so outraged by what she saw there and the human rights atrocities that she co-founded an organization called My Sister's Keeper, a grassroots initiative that advocates for women and children who are trying to rebuild their country and their lives. Liz returns to Sudan often, including the region of Darfur, a scene of the 21st century first genocide. My, sis my sister's keeper has most recently completed the construction of a girls' school that opened to more than 1,000 girls in South Sudan. Liz shot her own video during her trip to Sudan and has produced several documentaries on the troubled country, including A Glory from the God, profiling the work of my sister's keeper and its visionary Boston humanitarian, Dr. Gloria White Hammond, who also is my pastor at Bethel Amy Church. Uh, little plug there. <laughs> Liz, who broadcast journalism, whose broadcast journalism career began in her hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas, worked on television stations in Denver, Colorado, San Francisco, California, um, and Boston, where she currently is. She is the recipient of two 
Emmy Awards, an Edward R. Morrow Award, and a special recognition for the prestigious, from the prestigious Gabriel Awards on her on the air and documentary work. She knows what it means to give voice. Liz is a member of the Board of Trustees for Tufts Health Foundation. She's a member of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, chair of the board of the Roxbury Presbyterian Church Social Impact, and on the board of Andover Newton Theological School, where I believe our first lady, um, Lynn Baker Dooley, also went. So a nice little connection there. Liz is an ordained minister in the African American, African Methodist, I should know because I'm AME, African Methodist Episcopal tradition, and is currently a transitional minister at Roxbury Presbyterian Church in Boston. More importantly, Liz and I ride bikes together. <laughs> and she is ferocious on a bike. I remember the very first time I saw her, uh, and this is how we connected. Yes, I know her through church and on the television and as this kind of iconic figure, but I got to know Liz as a human being when we were riding bikes on the Charles, and I rode with this group of, you know, male bikers from the community, and we came out with our basketball sneakers and cargo shorts and T-shirts, and there she was looking like straight out of Tour de France with her biking gear on, and she was ready to go and took off. And that was a, a wonderful time of, I, I think it's a lesson in diversity because it's not what you expect. You don't expect a group of you know, black folks in Roxbury to be a, a coordinated writing group. And we connected, and she made the funniest comment, which forever you know, rings, in, rings in my mind. And she said, you know, Naomi, I love the church and the work that I'm doing there, but my church is here on the bike. And we have this wonderful spiritual connection when we ride to the top of the Arnold Arboretum, which is a, this mountain, little mountain in Boston, and we rest, and we just talk about issues like you did this afternoon and you did this morning. We talk about politics and we talk about religion and we talk about different things and we have our open space out there in our sweaty bicycle gear. And so I thought she was perfect because open space conversation is what we have been doing for the last year on our bikes, sweating in the Arnold Arboretum. Liz Walker. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I, oh, no, y'all going to have to help me. When I say good afternoon, I just really hope and pray for an answer. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. As a minister in the African-American tradition, we believe in call and response. So I, I thank you very much for having me here. I am so impressed that this university is having this conversation. Uh, this is a rare conversation, I have to tell you. Nobody's doing this, and everybody should be doing this, because it's the only way we can grow as people, and as a society, as a country, and as a world. So I salute you for this vital conversation. Naomi, I have your glasses. Do you need them? You're all right? Okay, great. I don't know. I just want to make sure. I was a television journalist in Boston. I did, do you even get Boston TV down in Rhode Island? Is, does, I mean, no, seriously, I don't know. Do, do you, have you ever you Boston TV sometimes? Because you might get New York TV here. But for many, many, many years, I was on television in Boston. Now, for many of you, that's probably ancient history, and it, and it was. I retired or res I got off the 11 o'clock, 6 o'clock main news back in 2001. But before that... I did the 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock news for, for many years. Now, this was back in the day. This is how long ago this was, when there were only three channels. You have no idea what that's about, most of you, right? Three, there were only three channels, and here's the, here's the real stopper. You actually had to get up. You had to walk over, and you had to go change the channel with your hand which just seems impossible now, but th this was back in the day when we actually had phone booths. Does anybody know? I don't think you have phone booths anywhere now. I mean, maybe you do have a few. 
And there was a man named Superman, and that's a whole nother story, anyway. <laughs> television news, I tell you about television news because I believe if there's anything that stops our sense of diversity, it's television. I know this because I worked in television for many, many years. The images that we see on television, with the exception of some images you might see on public television or the History Channel, most of the images you see on television do not speak of diversity. Television news is absolutely the worst culprit because we deal in confrontation, in conflict. There's always a, a war going on. There's always a fight going on. So you never see anything but these images that are very uh, uh, anti-harmony, very much against unity. And I defy anyone to argue with me on that because I know television and conflict is what draws attention. Conflict is what gets you to watch. It's like watching a train wreck. That's why you watch TV in many ways. Now certainly television does a lot of good. Certainly it has opened up the world to us. But I dare say most of the images that you see have not helped you. They've actually hurt you in your sense of diversity. Let me tell you a story. When I was a little girl, the only television that I watched, I watched Saturday television. Now, this was ancient history. It was black and white back then. That's a whole nother world. And I would watch Tarzan every Saturday. Does anybody even remember? Do they even do Tarzan anymore? <laughs> nah. Well, Tarzan was this big white guy from England who became king of the jungle in Africa. Go figure. And he would, every Saturday, this was way back, Johnny Weissmuller was Tarzan. And I would watch it. I love this show. But every Saturday morning, Johnny Weissmuller as Tarzan would be chased by a thousand Africans. You never knew what country this tribe came from. You never heard these Africans speak. All you knew on Saturday morning TV was that these Africans were mad at Tarzan. So every morning, Every Saturday morning, they would chase Tarzan across the jungle into the water. Then they'd get to a cliff. And every Saturday morning, without fail, Johnny Weissmuller, as Tarzan, would grab a vine, swing across a cliff, and go to the other side. Does anybody, you remember this, right? <laughs> I knew somebody out here has seen this same, this same movie. Every Saturday morning. And every Saturday morning, without fail, at least 500 Africans will go over the cliff. That was the image that I saw of Africa as a child. So if you said to me, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I did not know if I could be Tarzan. That didn't seem very realistic. But I knew I didn't want to be African because there was no future in that. You would end up over a cliff. I dare say that the images of Africa have only changed a little bit since then. And that was 100 years ago. What we see on television is about conflict, famines in Africa, and fights in the Middle East. And I've got to tell you that once you open yourself up to the world, you find there's more going on than conflicts and famine. Indeed, there are lots of conflicts, and indeed, there is famine. But there's more to the world than that. And that is what I discovered when I left my work as a television news reporter and went to Sudan. I went to Sudan back in 2001 on a story to cover a group of Bostonians who were investigating allegations of slavery. I could not believe that in the 21st century, People were being enslaved, but indeed that is part of Sudan. As a matter of fact, I'm sure in a college campus you know that slavery is ongoing all over the world right now, including this country. And so in Sudan, slavery was a part of a war that had been ongoing for at least two decades that pitted the Islamist North, a very strict interpretation of Islam, a very political and a very rigid interpretation of Islam was being practiced by the people who ran the north against the south of Sudan, which, was, uh, which at that point was 
Christians and animist tribes and all kinds of different people. And so this conflict was these two different parts of this huge country, because Sudan is, of course, you know, the largest country in Africa. It is in the north and east of Africa. It is bordered on the north by Libya and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and on the south it is bordered by Uganda and uh, Kenya and other countries. So Sudan's been involved in this war for two decades. Nobody had told me about this war. I had, I'm a reporter and had not heard anything about this war. I go with these people from Boston to cover this war, who want to find out if slavery is ongoing, having no idea what I was getting into. I went to my news director. I said, Peter, this is a great story. We have got to cover this war in Sudan. Peter said, you know what? That's an international story. We're a local television sto station. Our people aren't interested in those kind of stories. We leave those to the network. So I decided I'd go on my own. Peter didn't want me to go for the newsroom. I would take my own camera. He gave me my vacation time. I did. I went there, and what I saw, I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe that people were living like that out in the world, and nobody was doing anything. And as I said, this war had been ongoing for two decades. It was a war based on oil. It was a war based on religion. It was a war that was being pitted over culture. It was a war that was pitted over race. It was based on all these different issues, all mixed up into one. And people were being enslaved, taken from the south to the north, forced into labor because of this war. And at the very bottom of all the people who were being marginalized and oppressed and hurt were women. Men were being killed and women were being raped because rape, down through history, has been a tool of war all over the world. And I was incensed. I was blown away. But what incensed me most was how ignorant I was about the world. I didn't know. And I've been to college, been to grad school, didn't know what was going on about the world. Why weren't television news uh, operations covering the war in Sudan? Why wasn't this important? So I'm shooting this video. We are talking to people. They're giving us their stories about this horrendous war. They're telling us how their villages have been attacked. And these are people who are not warriors. These are people who are just in the way of, of the armies. They're telling us how their babies have been killed and how their husbands have been macheted and hacked to death. They're telling us these horrible stories, and I'm shooting, and I'm shooting, and I'm shooting. And you know how sometimes you're in a situation and, and everything changes. Maybe it doesn't happen very often, but it happened for me here. I think about the situation when uh, the hurricane hit New Orleans. Remember that? And there were people on rooftops, and they had white, I'm going to put on my uh, mic, so moving around. Is that all right if I stand closer to you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we can do this as a team. Now, my mic is on. I have muted it. There you go. Now my mic is on. All right, now we are a team. In New Orleans, when the Katrina hit the, the, the bayou and hit that coastline, you see people on their roofs and they're they're swinging their white flags, and they're asking for help. And you have reporters from all over the world in helicopters flying over it, reporting on the situation, because that's a reporter's job. But every once in a while, I believe, a reporter is called to step out of that comfort zone and step out of that helicopter, maybe after it lands, but do something, <laughs> do something that takes him out of that objective, so-called objective viewing, into that subjective action situation. You've got to step out of this comfort zone that says, my only job is to report this, and you've got to do something. And that's what happened to me in Sudan. I was talking to women. One woman told us the army of the north had come to the south, and they had 15 soldiers had raped her. One woman told me this. And she's speaking in a very, it was, it was horrendous. I'm sobbing behind the camera, and she's speaking in this kind of disconnected, uh, removed way because she's a victim of trauma. 
And so my life changed, and I had to put the camera down, and everything else changed. And we decided to do something. It wasn't really my idea. It was a woman by the name of Gloria White Hammond, who is a minister of a church, who is my shero in the world. And Reverend Hammond said, you know what? There's something we can do. And I thought, I don't even know these people, and they're suffering. What could we possibly do? This is an intractable war that's been going on for two decades. How can we make a difference? And she said, that's what we've got to do. We've got to figure it out. But it didn't happen for me until I stepped outside of my own comfort zone. I thought I was a reporter. I thought that's what I had to do. And there was more that I had to do. And so we worked in Sudan for 12 years, from 2001, 11 years, from 2001, building the school because the people asked us to do that. They also asked us to help them stop the war. We didn't know if we could do that, but we knew we could do something. And so we built relationship with these people. In one village, we kept going back and forth, back and forth. We learned a little bit about the language. We learned a little bit more about the conflict. In Sudan, you now know that South Sudan is the world's newest country. The big Sudan split into two countries because of this war that I've been telling you about. And so we learned a little bit more about the conflict, but most importantly, we learned about the people. There are more than 500 tribes in the south of Sudan. Many of them fight each other. If you went to Sudan right now, you would think they were all the same. They all, look, they all are very black. But there are differences that have come out over generations that people have created a lot of it created by uh, the colonial uh, era when the British came and other countries came and took over, but they have created these differences. And so people who had for centuries lived as, as one now are all broken up and fighting each other. And you think, my God, what happened? You all look alike. You can't even tell the difference between each other and you're fighting. And it teaches you that there's something that we create in the world that breaks us up. I am thoroughly convinced that this world is very small, very, very tiny, and that we hear a message through the media and maybe through government sometimes and maybe through our own heads or our own cultures that the world is, is divided up into us and them. But since I have been all over the world watching the situation in Sudan, making friends with people there, working to support people there. I believe there is only us. And we'll either figure it out or we'll perish. The first year I'm there, I do this story on the, on the slave trade, on the people who have been in the war. This is 2001, in the summer of 2001. And we find out while we're there, we're there for about three weeks in the south of Sudan, that this man has built this terrorist network in Sudan, man from Saudi Arabia. And the people are telling us, this guy is horrible. This guy's going to take over the world. He hates America. Osama bin Laden, that was the story. Now, Osama bin Laden was not unknown to America. Certainly, there were tribes underway that year for the bombings in Africa, in Kenya, in Nairobi. So he was known, but he wasn't known generally. So I had this story in 2001, in the summer. So I come back to Peter. I said, Peter, I shot my own video. I did my own thing. But guess what I got? I got a story on uh, Bostonians working on slavery in the bush, in this deep, isolated place. I've got story of this war that that's, that's, has slavery. And I've got the story of a terrorist network that's being built in Sudan. And Peter said, you know what? That's a national story, an international story. We're a local television station. That's their issue, not ours. We don't cover that kind of news. So Peter and I fought back and forth, fought back and forth all summer, trying to get this story. Peter was my news director at the time, all trying to get this story on the air. Finally, and this is the truth, Peter decided to run my story September 11th, 2001. Oh, God. That's the truth. Now, my story would not have broken ground. It would not have changed anything. But what it would have shown us had it run, and of course it didn't run, 
because the whole world changed that morning. What Peter and I learned from that event was that the people we say are, the, are them, they became us that day. We said the situation that was theirs, it became ours. There is only us. And we have got to figure out how to live together. Now, you don't have to go to Sudan to see conflict. You can go to Congress in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and figure out what nobody seems to want to work together. Cannot we work these things out? Now, I'm hoping that they're working it out. But from what I've seen, this, this attitude and atmosphere of isolation seems to be permeating this country, us and them. It's not just in Congress. It could be on this campus, though it doesn't seem so with all of you here. But there's this, this feeling that I have to win, and if I win, you have to lose. That's a message that is being created to a great extent by the media, to a great extent by those who have their own self-interest, but it's the message you have to get beyond, and it's why this conversation is so important today. Sudan ultimately changed my life. I now am not as afraid as I used to be about going up to someone who's different from me. And it's not about race. It could be just walking into a room like this where no one knows me. But you and I have more in common than we have that separates us. And that's what I learned from the Sudanese. Because you see, the women and men and children that I talked to were trying to survive. The war was going on, it's still going on, but the people were just trying to survive. My last Sudan story, and one I want to leave you with, because I, I'm gonna, I think we've got just a few minutes for question and answer, so let me just give you this story. One of the last times we went to Sudan, and we traveled 50, 60, 70 times, I, I can't even tell you how many times that Gloria White Hammond and I traveled back and forth and, and, and other people in the effort to build a school, one of our last visits to Sudan, we lost our luggage somewhere between Boston and Chicago and Nairobi. Now, the world will tell you we lost it in Nairobi. I'm pretty sure it was Chicago. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Nairobi, Kenya, get off the plane, traveling 21 hours. Boy, we're, we're splitting up now? Oh, my goodness. So we have another uh, 21 hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, get to the ground in Kenya discover there's no luggage. Now, the seriousness of that is that we're having to travel from Nairobi, Kenya, into Sudan, which is another plane ride into the bush. In southern Sudan, there is no infrastructure. There are no hotels. There are no roads. They may be building them right now, but there were, certainly weren't when we were traveling. We had to take our own tents in. We had to take our own water. We had to take our own food. Everything you wanted, you had to take with you because you're going into a part of the world that is not that developed. So we're deciding what we're going to do. I want to go back. Gloria says, no, we got to go forward because we have a job to do. So we go into Nairobi. We buy a few supplies, all that we can find, some T-shirts perhaps, a pair of jeans. We had nothing. Word got to this village through some of our interpreters and the people that we work with. This is the village of Akan where we built our school. Word got there that we had lost everything. By the time our plane landed in Akan, Sudan, four hours later from the time that we'd started purchasing things and bringing our little plastic bags, we get off the plane. This will be the movie when I write the movie after I write the book about my experiences. We get off this charter plane. And the people in the village have heard that we have lost everything. And so they come to the plane with gifts. The women bring us wraps that we can wear, that they have found and that they have. This is a place where they have nothing. The men have, have built these hand-hewn cots out of wood. And they bring two of them to us so that we could put them in our tukul, in our hut. The old women bring pots of goat meat so that we would have some food. And the little children even brought us these sticks that you use. I can't think of the name, but you use them as toothbrushes. And it dawned on me that we had come to Sudan as these arrogant Americans who always have the answers to save Africa. And Africa 
saved us. One of the reasons that we have got to know each other is because we need each other. You're going to learn that when there's a hurricane. You learn that when there's a war. You learn that on a September 11th. And then you forget until the next hurricane or the next war or the next September 11th. But I guarantee you, we all need each other. As hokey and corny as that is, that is the one profound truth that I have learned in my life of finding many truths. So I applaud you. I salute you. I thank you. Have your conversations. What the heck? Have your arguments. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> That's all right, darling. Here's what I'll say to that. There's a lot of dark corners in this world. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I would guarantee you that most of the world's in darkness right now. You have to be the light. God bless you and thank you. Is this working? Whew, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Please, 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 sit down, sit down, sit down. Uh, Is there time to do Q&A? No, I don't think there's time. Maybe one or two questions. You want to? Yeah, just one or two quick ways. Okay, we're just, if anybody has a question, if not, no problem. You're not hurting my feelings. But if you did have a question about the situation in Sudan, one thought, since you don't, women, those of you who work on women's issues, need to know, and you know this already, but for the rest of this uh, community, that when you raise up women, you raise up the world. Be not because you're a feminist or you're trying to burn your bra. I can't burn a bra anymore. I need all the support I got. <laughs> but when you raise up women, you're raising up children and you're raising up the entire village. If you haven't read Nicholas Kristof's book, Half the Sky, you should read it, because it tells you about women all over the world in horrendous situations, like Sudan, that must be lifted up. God bless you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going this way. I'm oh, staying. I just want to say thank you so much for coming. And, you know, when you said, if we don't figure it out, we'll perish, I just think that that's such an important message for us, because we are preparing to our students for a global community to live in. And if we don't figure it out, if we don't figure out how to get along, it's going to be problematic. So thank you thank again. You, Can we give her another round of applause? Thank you. God bless. Thank you, sweetie. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, again, my name is Melissa Boyd Colvin, and I serve as the Assistant Director for Student Leadership. I am also so pleased to see so many individuals come together in the room to continue our conversations on community, equity, and diversity. For those who joined us in the morning session, you know what is coming next. But for the individuals who are new to the room, I want to welcome you once again and officially open the space as we continue our conversation using open space technology. In just a moment, we'll start to scroll a slideshow again, which overviews what that is and what our approach will be for this session from approximately 1230 to 145. But in general, what that information is, is the opportunity to engage in dialogue and discussion. To my right, your left, is the marketplace the list of available opportunities for discussion and dialogue. The, tarp, the top part of our wall indicates what has already been discussed this morning from sessions including more funding for multicultural student organizations to looking at neurodiversity, issues of retention and hiring for multicultural staff members as well as for recruitment of multicultural students across the board creating inclusive practices for pedagogy. So this morning, a variety of interesting topics were posed for us. And this afternoon, the charge is before us as well. 
You'll note on the bottom part of the wall that is in the marketplace, there are nine available poster sessions, some of which already have what we deem the provocative or wicked question asked. Items um, such as the ones listed below, I believe there are four session topics on the bottom of the wall already posted. And we do have nine available opportunities. I have two more in my hand, which means from the crowd of individuals that are before us, you have some blank topics in front of you on your on your tables, some sheets to pose those questions. So in just a moment, I will invite individuals who would like to pose at least three new topics to add to our marketplace for discussion. Anyone may be a convener, faculty, students, staff, community members, we invite you to pose those topics. You may pose a topic that is similar to something that is already presented. So in a moment, I will ask all individuals who are interested in convening a session to come forward to the stage, be prepared to introduce yourself and your topic that's it. Share that with the room. Then we will highlight where those sessions will take place in this building, and all of you may disperse as you see appropriate. You'll see before you a bit of information coming up that talks about our process. There are very simple rules to how we will do this. First and foremost, we thank you for accepting the invitation for being here. Whoever is here are the right people. We're looking for your passion and your engagement along these issues. We also will start briefly and end when we need to, although we have the time and space until the end of the class period at 2.15. At which time, we're going to ask that folks come back here and review all of the items that are in our newsroom. And that's where we report out in paper everything that has happened. As well as online, those proceedings are being posted live as well. In addition, what's very important to note in the newsroom is in your sessions, we're asking you to come forward with at least two to three action items, things that we will vote on as a community as key priorities and strategies to move forward at the end of our day. We do that just after 2.15, so please join us, encourage others to come back to this space, hear the outcome of those sessions, and vote on those priorities. The other key piece about open space technology is I'd like to tell you about the law of mobility. And that will be critical in these nine or so sessions that we have come forward in just a moment. That is, if you choose to engage in a session and you are no longer being productive or learning or not engaged, please choose to leave and move to another session. You have that right and responsibility to be as productive as you possibly can during this time. No one will be offended. That is the essence of the day. Please choose to engage as you wish. Cross-pollinate ideas. Move from one session to another. Open space is about taking advantage of every opportunity to engage in community. Instead of feeling like you're stuck and stagnant, stagnant, please move and enjoy the process. Um, so the tricky part of our time together begins. We have approximately six topics on the lower portion of the wall. We need three more. I will ask all interested conveners who have already posted their topic to come forward to me and introduce yourself in a moment and allow just a couple minutes, if we can do it in five minutes or so, to invite three or so additional topics to come forward, please do, and then we will let you know where those, those particular sessions are meeting. Keep in mind, you may need to co-convene. You may have a similar passion topic to others in the room, and we will make sure you have that space. Ladies and gentlemen, officially, as you watch the so slideshow behind me, please feel free to ask any of the committee members individual about the process. Please be prepared to be surprised and engaged in the process. And please feel free to pose your wicked and provocative questions for group discussion. Conveners, please come forward and welcome to open space. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may call your attention once again to the front. I can see that folks are inspecting the marketplace, the sessions again at the top of our board were this morning sessions, the lower portion will be offered this afternoon. A few are already posted 
and in a few moments we will bridge those postings with new postings and let you know where they will be indicated. In addition, I want to highlight some individuals who are to my left. These are the class members of the graduate program for college student personnel. We can give them applause. They've been working hard today. They will be in each of these sessions capturing the content that occurs, both in written form to be displayed in our newsroom, as well as online for folks who could not engage this afternoon here live. So please watch for those updates. Conveners, they will be an excellent resource for you. I am going to ask our conveners to tell us their name as well as their topic. That's it brief introductions, and then walk with me to the wall to find a stated room selection. We have 10 possible topics for this afternoon. And please note, one may be in this room. We will decide that when we see how many folks move from one space to another. Please listen and hear what opportunities exist for you to engage. I'll turn it over to them. Um, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm a student here, and I'm also a staff member at the LGBTQ Center. Uh, my convention today will be about uh, gender inclusion on campus. Um, so if you're interested, I believe we're meeting in room 354, um, so upstairs. Um, my name's Amy Phelps Lee, and I'm Heather Maselli. And we're going to convene a session on um, inclusive pedagogy and how we do it, what it looks like, and where we can get it in place as quickly as possible. Hi everyone, my name is Antia Frias, and my um, this convener, convene, what? Yeah, convene. Let's say I'm going to convene. I'm going to convene, and it's called um, more opportunities for multicultural students to attend the university other than talent development. Ooh, nice. right. 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 Hello, my name is um, Jermaine Stevens, and uh, the session that we're going to run is um unification and separation on campus between multicultural orgs and um, frats and sororities. Um, we've kind of decided to work together because ours are very similar. Um, the title that I was working with originally was Bringing Back Bridges, for those of you who have been here for a while, um, a community building event for students, faculty, and staff around all issues of diversity and inclusion on campus. Hi, my name is Datula Matthews, and I would like to convene a session about being a young or mature parent or spouse on campus and a community built around supporting our academic life here. Hi, I'm Lexi Halpin, and I will be convening a session on challenge and support. How do you know that you're ready to have these discussions? How do you know your, your faculty and your, former, your students alongside of you are also? Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Chantal Sikos, and I'm going to be doing a session on Rhode Island same-sex marriage considerations for students, faculty, and staff. Hi, I'm Barb Silver and Tammy Vargas Warner, and we're convening a session on the retention of underrepresented faculty and staff. So, some intriguing opportunities. In just a moment, we'll let our conveners post their location, so please give them a moment, and then you'll be able to move to your desired session. Please, again, plan on joining us back here for 2.15 for voting and convergence. And please note that this committee and group has provided uh, not only lunch for those who joined us, but T-shirts as well that you will help us promote the message and celebrate the day. Those are available to all of you in the back of the room as well. Thank you, and please look forward to the marketplace in just a moment.